Whether it's Patty Boyd or Yoko Ono, the partners of famous musicians have inspired countless love songs. But sometimes a groupie can be the muse for a classic tune, as Jimi Hendrix, the Rolling Stones, and many others know all too well. Given that she was known as Cynthia Plastercaster, the song inspired by groupie artist Cynthia Albritton is kind of obvious, at least for KISS fans. That would be the Gene Simmons pen tune Plastercaster. The footnote to this is that he never participated in one of her sessions, in which she created statues that she referred to as her sweet babies. What sessions were those? Making plaster casts of the erect members of various rock stars. For All Britain, it was a massive art school project that started with Jimi Hendrix and continued to include a who's who list of male musicians. Simmons, however, apparently had something more carnal in mind when he wrote these lyrics. The plaster is getting harder and my love is perfection, a token of my love for her collection. In 2023, the year after her death, Indiana University's Kinsey Institute announced that they had acquired her collection, which included molds made as recently as 2014. While countless groupies have complicated legacies, there's perhaps none more complicated than the one left behind by Kathy Smith. In 1982, she gave an interview in which she confessed to administering a fatal dose of heroin and cocaine to John Belushi, leading to a second-degree murder conviction. About a decade before that, she transitioned from traveling with a group that would later become the band to reconnecting with a singer who she previously had an affair with, Gordon Lightfoot. At the time they became serious, Lightfoot was divorced. But according to Nicholas Jennings' biography Lightfoot, their relationship was anything but easy. That said, Smith's tendency to flirt with anyone who caught her eye meant that trust really wasn't part of the relationship. The pair were living in a small town outside of Toronto, when one night Smith drove into the city to party with some friends. Lightfoot grew worried about what she might be doing without him and sat down to write a song about her. You gotta work on, work on the idea before you start working on the song. The singer explained in Jennings' book, I was hoping that no one else would get their hands on her because she was pretty good looking. The song was Sundown and it would become one of Lightfoot's biggest hits. Part of being a groupie in the 1970s involved promoting the acts they had attached themselves to, and that's what Linda Keith did with Jimi Hendrix. At the time she met Hendrix, she was involved with another famous name, Keith Richards. Does it get complicated? Absolutely. Keith told The Guardian that she first saw Hendrix in New York and was instantly captivated. Keith would later be immortalized in the Hendrix song Send My Love to Linda, in which he wrote, Send my love to Linda. She lit a fire way down inside. She made the sun shine in my eye. God, let me hold her once more before I die. That's an absolutely beautiful tribute, but it's not the only one she had written to her. She was also the inspiration behind the Rolling Stones' Ruby Tuesday. Richards would explain that the song was written after she left him, thus ending their two-year relationship. Richards wrote in his autobiography, Life, That's the first time I felt the deep cut. The thing about being a songwriter is, even if you've been f***ed over, you can find consolation in writing about it and pour it out. Basically, Linda is Ruby Tuesday. Whole Lotta Rosie is one of ACDC's best-known songs, but who exactly is Rosie? That's apparently been a question people have been asking for a long time, and while no Rosie ever came forward, it turns out that a little determination can lead to a lot of answers. Jesse Fink is the author of two books on the band, and in 2023, he published a blog post confirming that he had found the true identity of Rosie. The often told tale is that Rosie was a regular at ACDC shows, and after spending the night with lead singer Bon Scott, she boasted to him that he was the 29th famous person she'd slept with. Other details were non-existent until Fink was contacted by a source who explained that she had known the Rosie in question. Her name was Rosemarie Garcia, and she died in 1979. The source claimed that Garcia had dated Scott for around six months. The source further explained that she had been a sex worker whose death had been connected to heroin and drug use. That information led to the discovery of her death certificate, which confirmed that she had died when she was just 22 years old. If there is any musician who has lived a life that reads like a fictionalized version of a rock star, it's Jimi Hendrix. Which is a groovy thing. It's fitting, then, that the inspiration behind his famous Dolly Dagger is just as incredible. And yes, she was a very real person named Devin Wilson. Wilson, the story goes, hooked up with Hendrix as not only his primary girl, but as the one getting everything the band needed. That, of course, meant drugs and other girls. Recording engineer Eddie Kramer, who worked with Hendrix, told Classic Rock, Devin was a presence, very beautiful, very commanding, with quite an edge to her, but she was funny. Wilson, however, didn't have a happy ending to her story. In 1971, she was killed when she fell out of a window at the Chelsea Hotel. Bodies by the Sex Pistols is a pretty dark song. It starts, She was a girl from Birmingham. She just had an abortion. She was a case of insanity. Her name was Pauline. She lived in a tree. She was a no one who killed her baby. Contrary to the lyrics, though, Pauline wasn't just no one. 
she was a very real someone. She's mentioned in the Sex Pistols biopic Pistol, and when the Cinemaholic did a deep dive into whether or not she was a real person, they confirmed that she was. Pauline was a punk rock groupie with a horrifying background. Committed to a mental institution in Northern England, she was said to have been sexually assaulted by an employee before fleeing to London and establishing herself in the underground punk scene. And as to the abortion reference in the song, well, the Sex Pistols singer John Lydon has said that it's inspired by her story too. Lydon explained, She tell me about getting pregnant by the male nurses at the asylum or whatever. There isn't much more that's known about the woman that inspired bodies, and even though the story was backed up by other members of the group, much of Pauline's story remains shrouded in mystery. Groupies are, of course, well known for their sexual liaisons, even though many will say that's only a small part of what being a groupie means. Groupies sleep with rock stars because they want to be near someone famous. We're here because of the music. So who was John Cale referring to when he wrote these lyrics? The bugger in the short sleeves f my wife. Did it quick and split. Back home, fresh as a daisy to Maisie. Oh, Maisie. His wife at the time was Cynthia Sue Wells, who was one of the members of the GTOs, the Frank Zappa-assembled group made up entirely of groupies. The story goes that Cal wrote the song called Guts, and it was absolutely meant to be a shot at industry staple Kevin Ayers. Ayers and Wells hooked up at around the same time the live album was recorded, which Cale knew about. By writing the song, Cale wanted Ayers to know that the affair with his wife wasn't the sort of thing that was going to be swept under the rug. Connie Hamsey's connection with the music scene started when she attended a Steppenwolf concert at 15 years old. Moreover, she later credited her mother's insistence on dropping her off at concerts early for giving her time to mingle with some of the biggest names in music. It was Grand Funk Railroad who did the song most commonly associated with her. In the iconic We're an American Band, they sing, Out on the road for 40 days. Last night in Little Rock put me in a haze. Sweet, sweet Connie doing her act. She had the whole show, and that's a natural fact. I said, yeah, I'll have to see it to believe it. Hamzy, who died in 2021, previously told Rolling Stone that she considered herself a groupie from the very beginning, explaining, It has become an addiction. No matter how hard I try, I just can't give it up. It's the thrill, the chase, the challenge of getting to meet a famous star that lures me back time and again. Look back through the music industry and it quickly becomes clear that there are a lot of things that are deeply troubling, particularly the idea of the baby groupie, which includes girls as young as 12 and 13. And it's not as if it was an industry secret. For instance, when Iggy Pop wrote Look Away about Sable Star, it didn't really leave much room for interpretation. Pop sang, I slept with Sable when she was 13. Her parents were too rich to do anything. She rocked her way around LA, till a New York doll carried her away. When fellow baby groupie Lori Maddox talked to Thrillist in 2015, she said that Star had already firmly established herself in the groupie scene by the time they met. They were both 14, and at the time, Star was involved with Iggy Pop. Maddox recalled her own involvement with David Bowie and how it drove a wedge between the two, a scene that would play out again with Jimmy Page. Maddox shared some insight as to what it was like in the cutthroat circle, saying, Especially after the Bowie incident, I was truly afraid Sable would beat me up, kill me, crucify me, 86 me out of Hollywood. She was the queen of the groupies. There's little question as to the song that was inspired by Patty Darbinville. After all, her name is right in the song title. Lady Darbinville was a single off Cat Stevens' 1970 album Mona Bone Jacone, in which she sang, My Lady Darbinville, why does it drive me so? But your heart seems so silent, why do you breathe so low? According to the official story on CatStevens.com, Stevens and Darbinville were in a serious relationship. It ended with her returning to the U.S. Stevens later wrote a song about her, which she sang to Darbinville over the phone. She said on the website, I cried when I heard it because that's when I knew it was over for good. Darbinville ultimately stayed in the groupie scene and became a good friend and trusted companion of groupie mainstay Pamela DeBar. Yeah, a lot of times you just want to be backstage, just involved in that scene. It's so exciting. In Debar's book, Let's Spend the Night Together, there's a whole chapter dedicated to Darbinville. In it, Debar says that it was the song Lady de Arbinville that had first intrigued her, and that she later got the whole story behind it. As the story goes, Darbinville had been dating a friend of Stevens when she met him. The relationship had lasted for about a year until she realized that Stevens was actually in love with her. Darbinville recalled in the book, It freaked me out. I was feeling like I couldn't give him what he wanted. I felt trapped. In Pamela DeBar's Let's Spend the Night Together, Patty D'Arbinville described Catherine James as the most beautiful creature she had ever laid eyes on. DeBar says there was quite a bit of hostile competition between her and James, at least initially. It was perhaps predictably over Jimmy Page, but DeBar says he was just the beginning. James was associated with names like Denny Lane and the Moody Blues. However, it was John Mayall who wrote a song about her called Miss James. Mayall wrote, I read about her in the magazine. The writer painted her in colors of a queen. Other people said bad things instead, so I was curious to check up what I'd read. But asking around, she couldn't be found. 
strange, elusive Miss James. Jackson Brown's Under the Falling Sky was also inspired by James. She had a young son by Lane at the time she and Brown got together. James has said that she and Brown were head over heels in love when he wrote the song for her. It wouldn't last, however, as James ultimately left him. Some groupies relied on gimmicks to make sure they got the attention they were craving, and that was the case with Barbara Cope. The Moody Blues nicknamed her Butter Queen for her unique use of the food, but it was the Rolling Stones who gave her a shout-out in their song Rip This Joint. Kiss me quick, baby, won't you make my day? Down to New Orleans with the Dixie Dean. Across to Dallas, Texas with the Butter Queen. Cope's mention alongside Dallas wasn't an accident. Buddy Magazine's one-time editor, Kirby Warnock, has said that pretty much everyone in the city knew who she was. This was especially the case for the musicians she hung out with, which included everyone from the Stones to Led Zeppelin. Her fame wasn't lasting, though, and when she was killed in a house fire in 2018, the Dallas Morning News reported that her neighbors had no idea who she was. By then, Cope was long retired, but not forgotten in music lore. She just gets a mention in the Stones song, but Three Man Army's tribute to her was much more obvious. Called Butter Queen, the song asked what many people wanted to know. How come they call you Butter Queen? Julia Holcomb was 16 when she set her sights on Aerosmith frontman Steven Tyler. In 2022, however, Holcomb sued Tyler, claiming he sexually assaulted her as a minor, among other charges. Holcomb said in a statement, I want this action to expose an industry that protects celebrity offenders, to cleanse and hold accountable an industry that both exploited and allowed me to be exploited for years, along with so many other naive and vulnerable kids and adults. Holcomb's claims are largely supported by Tyler's 2011 memoir, which Holcomb says convinced her to come forward with her own statement about the events. This includes Tyler allegedly forcing her to have a late-term abortion. I told him that I wanted my baby, and that even if he didn't want to marry me, I still wanted to keep my child. She's also said that he wrote a song about her, Seasons of Wither, which was released on the Get Your Wings album. Tyler wrote, Oh woe is me, I feel so badly for you. Oh woe is me, I feel so sadly for you in time. Bound to lose your mind, live on borrowed time. Take the wind right out of your sail. Tyler, meanwhile, has said that the song was inspired by late night walks down darkened roads. However, Holcomb has said that the song's devil was Tyler and that she was the blues-hearted lady. Anita Pallenberg is perhaps music's best example of a groupie whose influence on a band was undeniable. Her impact on shaping the look and sound of the Rolling Stones has been acknowledged for a long time, and according to The Guardian, she was also the inspiration for one of their most famous songs, Gimme Shelter. Keith Richards wrote about the song's genesis in his 2010 autobiography Life, saying that he had written it after Pallenberg acted in a movie that included some steamy sex scenes with Mick Jagger. The whole thing had put him in a pretty ferocious mood. Richards wrote in his book, It was just a terrible day, this incredible storm over London, so I got into that mode looking at all these people running like hell. That wasn't the only song that Pallenberg would influence, and she was also said to be the trippy lady of She's a Rainbow. In the lyrics, the song asks, Have you seen her in all gold, like a queen in days of old? She shoots colors all around, like a sunset going down. Have you seen a lady fairer? Morgana Welch was part of the baby groupie scene that centered around Los Angeles. In an interview with Please Kill Me, she said that they didn't even know they'd been dubbed the LA Queens until Led Zeppelin released the song Sick Again in 1975. Fast forward to the 21st century in a post-Me Too world, and the song is kind of hard to listen to. It includes lyrics like this, Come on, flash it, flash it in my eyes. Said you dug me since you were 13, then you giggle as you heave and sigh. According to Welch, the 1970s were a magical time when the biggest music fans could get up close and personal with all their favorite musicians. She went on to add that it was also a time when women were becoming very independent, unlike in previous eras. Welch is one of the many who condemned the double standard that exists between men and women and said that she has no regrets about her days as a groupie. She told Please Kill Me, It's what I did consciously and loved every minute of it. Thinking back, I would have done it more. In Rolling Stone's 1975 interview with Robert Plant and Jimmy Page, it was Plant to explain what the song meant, saying, The words show I feel a bit sorry for them. One minute she's 12 and the next minute she's 13 and over the top. Such a shame. They haven't got the style that they had in the old days. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.